Um, I thought we'd talk about uh, the relentless now. Um, this is a topic that's really interesting or in interests me a lot. Um, you know, like uh, a lot of people, I, I read Present Shock uh, by Douglas Rushkoff. If you haven't read it, check it out. Um, but he has these five tenets that really define living in the digital age. Um, uh, but the whole concept is we're living in this present shock. Um, and I just got done watching um, a special on digital amnesia. Um, and one of the terms they used was the relentless now. And then I've been doing a lot of reading on the Long Now Foundation's website. Um, so uh, for me, talking to other people and exploring how they see time. So how do you see time? Um, and then why do you feel busy? Um, and when you feel bored, what are the circumstances around it? And just really time in general. So how are we all experiencing time? Um, in a lot of ways, I'll just open it up with, I, I think time is collapsed like a star. Uh, and we're living in a relentless now. So we'll just open it up to anyone who wants to talk about their experience with time or any of those topics. Well, I, th I think that time is, personally, it's fleeting. Uh, there's never enough of it. But have you probably heard the, the, the quote, you know, God gave the same amount of time to Galileo and Da Vinci and Einstein. And look at all they accomplished. Um, but I, I always have something to do or somebody has something for me to do that needs to be done like yesterday. And I can't break myself of that cycle. It's hard. I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm too nice or naive or whatever, but I always feel like there has to be something productive being done or else my time is being wasted. So that's kind of a weird feeling. But you said you had some things that you helped yourself to kind of break of that type of... Yeah, yeah I've got a lot of little time digital habits. <laughs> we'll talk about it if you want. But uh, how, can anyone else share their experience with time or how they feel about time? I mean, I think this is like right up there with death, like this topic. I try not to think about either, but uh, I think one thing I've been thinking about is that, you know, we experience time dep differently depending on what activity we're involved in. And I think that's always been true. But the amount of diversity between the different activities that we're doing, I think, is probably far greater than any other time in human history. I mean, the gap between gardening and reading a book may not have been that large, but the difference between gardening, reading a book, driving, and um, playing a real-time strategy game is, is just so vast um, that I don't know that I really have a consistent experience of time. I think it just varies wildly in one day. Uh, might have a totally different like time profile from another day. So um, if, if, you don't have to answer, but um, if I can ask how old you are, or if you don't mind telling me when sure. you're... Yeah, so I'm 25. 25, okay. Um, so if you, if, when you, when you, I guess when we introduce ourselves, if you could just say how old you are so I can get a concept of wh where time's coming from. So at, I'm 34. So at, at 25, you're saying throughout the day, you have wildly different perspection, uh, perspective. So at, at 20, did you feel that way five years ago? Uh, I think so. Okay. Has it been that way your whole life? Uh, I think it's gotten more like that over time. Uh, I think um, I think there's also just different, for instance, like when I'm wasting time, you know, if I'm just uh, screwing around on the internet, um, that time feels different because I'm every so often checking in with myself and being like, you shouldn't be doing this, go do something else, and then I somehow continue to, to waste time. And so that kind of, there's like a meta time narrative about how much time I'm spending, whereas if I'm in the zone reading. Everyone I've talked to who talks about time, when they say they're wasting time, they say the internet. Mm. But yet, so much of what we do is on the internet. So what activity is on the internet that's wasting time? For me, I just read articles. Okay, oh, so that's wasting time reading. Yeah, okay. I, I, I learn mean, things, no judgment. I'm just is a terrible waste. I'm just apparently. thinking about like how I look at my, my time. Okay. I guess for me, it's it's learning about topics I already know a lot about, where a very high percentage of what I'm reading is Reinforcing? Just confirming what I already know. So yeah. confirmation bias? Yeah. Active confirmation bias is wasting time. Y yes. That's actually a highly evolved way of looking at it. <laughs> Thanks. That's like a really enlightened. Like to, to spend time sometimes, I'll, I'll read the news. But if I'm wasting time, I'm reading the junk news stories. The crap that's on CNN that's like, why do we care about Britney Spears' personal life? That type of stuff. I don't read those articles per se, but you know, articles I wouldn't normally read if I'm bored, I'd read them. Um, but I forgot to mention before, and you know, like you were saying, time is all, it's different for every person. If you're enjoying something, obviously time goes faster. If you're not enjoying something, obviously it goes slower. 
but I'm, I'm a small business owner and, and I, you know, I work on the internet, so there's always work to be done. That's why I'm always in the relentless now, because I, if I'm enjoying something like reading a book, like I, I feel like I can't read a book now because there's work that could be done that I don't have to do tomorrow if I did it tonight. And, and that's the loop I'm stuck in. So. Uh, one, one question for you. You said you're 34? Have you always had this relationship with time, or do you think it's getting worse? It's only been since I've been in business for myself for about six years. So yeah, my, my event horizon for this paradox that I'm seeing is about eight years max. So I'd say it's smart, about smartphone time, I started seeing time collapse. OK. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, any time? Wait, what, what did you mean by eight year something? Uh, eight year event horizon. Uh, so for me, time started collapsing about eight years ago. So, and it's literally about the same time I started really getting into smartphones. Um, I, I'm not sure why, but if I look at 19, you know, anything before 2007, 2006, time seemed to be pretty much consistent. Uh, there were some times in my life that seemed definitely busier. There were some times in my life that definitely seemed slower. But I do feel in 2014 and probably definitely in 2015, I am suffering from a relentless now where there's always something to be done, built, or constructed. And I never felt that way before. There's always something new to be read, learned, or consumed. There's always something new to be uh, created, manifested, changed, augmented, participated with. There's this relentlessness to my time. I don't know how else to say it. So for me, personally, I've had to c construct a lot of, I'd say, uh, airbags for time. You know, like, so just, so when I hit a time wall, I have a safety. Pff, okay, you know, I'm not going to just literally, you know, hit, you know, 88 miles per hour and just bend myself. Because I will, we were talking, you know, before the group officially started, you know, there's been twice in the past three years where um, I ended up in the hospital because I was exhausted. And it's because I was just working, 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 working. And then the very first time it happened, I didn't know what had happened. I just knew I was freaking out. And uh, literally my body was shaking. And um, my doctor at that time, my physician told me, well, you're exhausted. And I said, yeah, I've been working, but I'm on vacation. I should be able to relax. I don't know how I ended up in a hospital. He said, your body actually is an instrument and it, it actually needs energy to slow down. And if you expend the last bit of that, you won't. You just die of, of exhaustion. People die of exhaustion all the time. But that state where mild forms of this are where you lay in bed at night ruminating, you know, it's kind of the first sign that you're kind of living in this relentless now. Uh, so for me, it really, this is about, you know, a safe group where I can talk about the things I do or the things we do. And just for me, I didn't, literally when I leave here, I have to do things that involve slowing down. You know, sometimes I'll literally take big steps when I'm walking. I'll move my, if I'm alone, I'll move my hand real slow. You know, so I've got lots of little things I do, but we'll, we can talk about my little antidotes later. But uh, I was just wondering, you know, I, I've talked to lots of people. Everybody seems to know what I'm talking about, but no one really wants to have like a discussion. So I thought maybe Cyborg Camp, you know, would be the, the place to have the temporal busy discussion. Thanks. Um, so this is interesting to me because I have less of this than almost anyone I know. And the way I, of the constant now, and I also have a baby new business, so I'm starting to experience some of what you're talking about. And the way I've been managing it for the last few years is my phones are either on and I'm hyper-connected or everything gets turned off. But when my brain needs a break, it can stay turned off for three days and that's not great. So the thing I'm struggling with is more soft transition. So it's not everything's on or everything's off. And also like the internet, the light skimming of confirmation bias. I have books this big that I actually want to get into, but as long as I'm skimming the articles, I'm not reading the stuff that's hard. And I would like to figure out how to do more of that. It was very little judgment about value, just self-hacking. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I like what you said earlier. Um, earlier she mentioned, what's your name? Uh, Jane. Uh, I'm sorry? Jane? Oh, Jay. Uh, Jay was talking earlier about airplane mode. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's so comforting to put my phone in airplane. I think I'm in airplane mode right now. Um, yeah. So uh, turn it off, put it in airplane mode. I hate turning it off because the time to wait for it to come back on actually seems about longer than like a whole day to watch the Apple light up and then kind of sit at the screen and then 
and then you have to wait them for the internet connection. It hurts so much. The airplane mode's much faster. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you guys fly a lot, but, like, flying is really amazing for me because it's just airplane mode is really cool. And it's interesting that, that Apple, I was, th I was thinking about this the other day, how Apple's even messing with time. Um, in 2012, all MacBooks got something called Power Nap, so that when your Apple was sleeping, it would still update. You know, and it's, if you start to look at what Apple's just doing how, with how they mess with time, I mean, even their watch, they said, was a fitness tracker, an intimate way to communicate, and a precision time piece. You know, so, you know, there's very weird things that are starting to happen with time and how we buy and sell and commoditize time. I don't know. Wait, so you would consider the Apple Watch to be some symptom of collapsing time because it does three I'm things. I'm sure it is. So that's, okay, so that's one definition of collapsed time is that now we're doing multiple things at once, whereas before we had time between the things? Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think a buffer between things really helps you, at least narrative. It gives you narrative because you can see a flow to things, a rhythm. Um, Right, but now you're looking at the time, and you can also see your heartbeat, so you're doing some, like, help. Well, yeah, so you're correlating two pieces of information, right? And then you've got text and email, so there's, like, more pieces more of More and more and more. What's really interesting about the Apple Watch is if you look at it, um, you've got stand, sit, and then move, and then it's tied to time. Whereas all the other fitness trackers are just how much move. It's not move over time, sit over time. But when they announced the iPhone, he said, I have three things I'm announcing today. A new browser a touchscreen, uh, iPod, and a phone. A new browser, iPhone, right? When they announced the watch, he said, I have three things I'm announcing today. A fitness tracker, an intimate way to communicate, and a precision timepiece. So the browser became an application platform. The telephone became anything but. And, and the touchscreen iPod became a complete digitization of everything we turned into a subscription economy. I believe fitness, time, an intimate way to communicate is going to change everything. But that's not time collapse. That's just how they're, that's how they're exploiting time collapse. So I think maybe the difference is not even whether or not you wear it. It's inten intentionality. It's whether or not you retrieve your email or if your email gets pushed to you. Because I think that the place where the time collapses is when your phone or whatever device you're using dictates when you get your update. Well, was it, what, to me, about the watch, I mean, I, I hate to turn this into the Apple Watch conversation, but if you think, what was so amazing was, like, the fact you draw to send something to someone, the fact you can tap to send something, a haptic, I can tap to you, you can feel it, or I can actually send you my heartbeat. So I can send you something I manifest, I can send you something that I actually forced to happen, right? So something I drew myself, something I forced to happen, or I can send you something biological. And they're all tracked over time on your side, because you can go back and browse our interactions, our, our haptic interactions over time. So it's as if you were to make Facebook physical. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's really profound. And then you tie that into just behavior, activity tracking. Edgy. Edgier than I think a lot of people are giving it credit for. But they waited for a reason. I mean, you want to say anything? Do you have any feelings about time? Uh, so I, I would have been much, I had a really good nine months <laughs> and wrote a book. Um, so before that I was a journalist doing the like five posts a week or more kind of thing. And so like it, the difficulty was an inability to distinguish between wasting time on the internet and doing my job. So they're the same thing. Um, uh, and it's still, there's some degree to that in terms of I still have trouble and I don't actually think it, knowing the difference between when I'm wasting time because often then like six months later that thing turns out to be the thing that solves a problem. So there's that, there's a, there's a, but having to write a book um, forced a lot of clarity uh, in terms of and breaking habits because in order to write a book, I needed to like not do other things. <laughs> um, and so I've, I am not as deeply experienced and it has to do with a lot of like turning off all the notifications, finding tools, software hacks that allow, basically offloading that 
brain thing, the like, I'm on the internet, but I know I should be doing something else problem. So that's like, there's this cognitive load of like, should I be doing what I'm doing right now? And so finding ways to make, take that decision away and to have made that decision and then just live with it for a chunk of time, right? Um, kindness or, uh, or a certain amount of discipline, right? Uh, a sort of firm kindness, um, yeah, um, can, can help a lot. Uh, you know, but that was nine months. Yeah, so um, in order to finish the book, so I like I was like, what a privilege to be able to take on a fellowship, where like I, w I was in the states with a visa that made it illegal for me to earn money, <laughs> so like I could there was nothing for me to do but attend things and write my book. Um, it was a pretty radical way of like making a break with a previous set of habits. I don't necessarily recommend it to anybody, but it was good. It was good for me. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm just starting. Um, good. I have. I mean, I've. Two days ago, I took my Twitter app off of my home screen just to break the habit of reaching for the same spot on the screen. Every like, it's still on my. I didn't even delete it. It's on my iPad still. It's just on a second screen. And like, eventually, I'm sure I'll develop a habit of swipe tap, and then I'll have to move it again to hide whatever. But. Um, but yeah, I'm moving, I'm doing less things and saying no to more things because it was really nice to have a book and I would like to do more projects that take a longer amount of time, which means I have to not do a lot of other projects that I might do. And that has helped push off the relentless by just like being more honest with other people about what I can commit to. I'll try and keep it super quick, but I have so many responses. So one thing is, as you mentioned, um, for people in sort of like creative class jobs where the unpredictability is so high, it is very hard to know when what you're doing is productive or not because the causation is never clear. Um, also, I think it's really important to talk about the role of capitalism. I mean, you know, we've run out of ways to expand geographically. We've, you know, the only place really to expand the economy is into people's time and attention. And so I think it's, you know, it's not just our lack of self-discipline. It's being actively pushed on us. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is just I think you really hit on it with, um, you know, the need now for self-discipline to foreclose options, you know, to, like, give your router to someone else for the weekend so that you can't use it. And I read a really great article uh, talking about in countries where it used to be that the lights would just go out at 8 p.m. because there was not enough electricity and then you just couldn't do things. And there's, you know, like you said, you as a business owner or me and whatever weird stuff I'm up to, like I can do literally anything at any time. And so there is no, it's there's only no, well, There is no time if you can do anything at any time. Yeah. It was weird. I was talking to a friend the other day. If you want to tie corporatism that's the word I like to use, with, with, with time. And she said the only way she knows it's fall is when she can get pumpkin spice at Starbucks. <laughs> and she actually now identifies the seasons through what Starbucks sells her and not the weather. Yeah, there, there is an article about how uh, the, pumpkin, the existence of pumpkin spice is a proof of Baudrillard's hyper-real, uh, uh, some advanced social theory that I still don't understand. But, um, you know, <laughs> pumpkin spice is not made out of pumpkin. It is not even pretending to represent something real. Yeah. It is just an entirely figmental thing. And then the last thing I want to say, and then I'll shut up, is um, uh, you talked a little bit about the role of narrative in time. And I think it's the number of articles that I'm reading. Um, I'm consuming hundreds, you know, dozens of narratives an hour. Um, and, you know, if I jump into a Twitter stream, then I'm on some narrative in Hong Kong time. And so I think the... Um, just the, the whiplash. I mean, I, I don't even know if I experience narratives in a time-based way anymore. Did you watch, well, that's it's interesting, did you watch Lost? Uh, the first two seasons. But yeah. did you ever notice Lost had like four or five timelines simultaneously? And then at the end of the show, they literally mixed time? Um, the, the last I read yeah. about that yeah, yeah. several times. But, um, but it was it. really weird because I, I've been noticing our media is a lot like this. I was talking to someone earlier about it. Like, everyone went crazy last year with Game of Thrones was killing off people. But like, I don't think that was because they were killing her. I think that was because people didn't expect time to stop. They just couldn't imagine a character being killed. Why would you do that? Because time doesn't... Because you always have the, the Real Housewives of Atlanta. You'll always have an American Idol. Things don't stop in media. And I think things that are really attention-grabbing in media now stop. 
So there's this weird, to your creative class, great book, uh, if you're talking about the book or just the concept of the creative class, um, how, how we're mixing or remixing time. I've watched, there's an, and something else if you're really interested in time collapse, um, there's an entire uh, YouTube series where kids have taken entire television shows or entire movies and just re-edited them to be one character's point of view. So you can watch all of Star Wars as Luke. You can watch all of Jurassic Park as the Doctor. You can watch all of any TV show as any one of the characters. Just go on YouTube, just look for them. Look for episodic, I can't remember the term they use, but just look for shows and then say Luke, Luke's point of view, someone's point of view. And you can watch entire genres that way. And I think that's so interesting that young people, or I don't know who's doing this, are taking shows and pulling them apart in time and just giving them to one person. So it's that one person's time, not all of our time. It just, I was like, wow, okay. And then I worked with someone the other day who said his seven-year-old son, when they moved the coffee table out, said, Daddy, but all the memories are in there. And he said, what are you talking? Because I've talked to my coworker about this a lot, and he, and about time collapse. And, and, and he said, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, everything we've ever done is in the coffee table. And his kid could actually see physical time in objects. So he started asking him what time was in the fork, what time was in newer objects. And as a child, I didn't see time in things. But as a child being raised by people who lived in time collapse, that's all the child could see. So, I mean, the, like if we know young, I always say I want access to children, but then I sound like Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> but if you have access <laughs> to children, ask them about what, how they see time in things or ask them about time. It's so interesting. That kind of, that kind of reminds me of something you said. Like, like the kids, they, they think differently. Uh, and kids are always in the now. I mean, uh, when I was a kid, it, I'd skip dinner to go play outside. Uh, but you had mentioned that time is like death in a way. And it really is. It's really the uh, death is the end of time for any one individual, right? Um, and time collapsing basically is death. Well, I mean, if you <laughs> think time, you know, if I'm in the relentless now because there's things to do or things that could be done, what about the people that are, are not necessarily afraid of dying, but they're trying to cram in as many possible experiences in their life before they do die? You know, that's, a, that's another reason why people can be in the relentless now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there are, there are all sorts of ways of this is being expressed. FOMO is one. Another one is uh, YOLO. Um, um, another one is uh, Too Long, Don't Read. Um, there are a million ways I'm seeing time, fear of missing out FOMO, sorry. It's weird because I'm seeing it expressed in business in all sorts of ways. Uh, I see, in case you missed it, that hashtag. Um, I'm seeing a lot of ways that people are re-expressing time or missing time for people, but they're not calling it that. I remember that one slide I had where I had that one Instagram picture with all those, like me in the Segway and then the speed and then the photo and then the map. Yeah, it was really good because I wanted to see how much, I call it atomic weight of a single photo, but I wanted to see how much atomic time and weight I could bring to a single photo. And it was crazy because it was one of the most popular photos I ever put on Instagram. And it was, I think it was only because I put so much in it and people couldn't flick by it. It was heavier. It was so heavy. They had to go slow through it. Um, you know, and if you're going to create something for people to interact with, it should slow them down. Maybe. I don't know. Or make it engaging enough. Yeah. yeah. It's something, something to think about. Um, the, the other thing I think that's interesting about uh, time collapse, where I'm seeing it expresses in social networks, so the onslaught of Throwback Thursday and Flashback Friday is, I think, a direct relationship to the fact that we need to see time again because we don't see it ever. So the fact we throw, we show posts, we show pictures of ourselves at different points of time during certain, certain times of the week to remind ourselves, A, it's that day, it's Thursday. And then B, it's been X number of years. You know, I, I, I don't know how much more clear it needs to be that time has collapsed, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. And, and it's actually slowing in some, I don't think it's actually speeding up. I think it's slowing down to almost nothing. I think we're about to hit dead time. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen when we just hit that zero mark. You know, does everything just stop? Or does everything become so fast that you can't see it? Hi. Let's take about five more minutes. Okay. And then everybody's going to move back around here. Cool. 
<laughs> Thoughts about media or social media or other time trends you're seeing? Oh, by the way, it's hard to unsee these once I tell them to you. <laughs> You'll leave here and see time everywhere. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I haven't thought about it as much as you have, but uh, I'll say that the one <laughs> regrettable thing I have with time is that I can't remember what I did last week or two weeks ago or even this past week. Um, it makes me cry. Oh, sorry. No, no, I mean, it's just really sad because I think that's just some... I mean, you saw my presentation. Do you remember what you did yesterday? Like, I'm sure I can think of it in a minute, but I don't remember right now. I have to think if I, if I yeah. wanted to about what I ate for dinner yeah, last night for just like a second, but like it's not instant. Yeah, yesterday is pretty I easy. I had that problem before technology. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if there, there was this problem before technology, uh, before all of this happened. I don't know at a mass level. I mean, it's not like we, we pay attention to our meals every So do you time. miss your memories? I, I just, I guess I just find it regrettable that I have nothing to show for the last month. Mm. I mean, it's I funny because I, in my presentation, I said you owe it to yourself to be able to search, search your stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, so you, uh, I, I just wasn't sure if, because you were the first person I ever met, and thank you again for no, the second social braveness today, where you like say, you know, I, I regret the fact I can't remember these things. Because I don't know, to me, I just. I, living this. Life. Yeah, for five years. I mean, we, we all, we're all, we have this onslaught of information with notifications and dings and dongs and all, and my phone has four different sounds for all these things. I think our brains are overloaded with the advent of smart technology and we're almost like bombarded to a point where we, we almost, everyone forgets. And the thing where I, where I get really worried about the next five years is as we move into the internet of things, I, you know, I read this great article about it, what they call the, the, uh, the, the personalization of things. So as things actually not only get the internet in them, but they become us, you know, how much more in something do we need to be, you know? I think it really starts to be this kind of, talk about time collapse, right? If everything is just constantly responding to you in a personalized way, non-organic things, then, you know, what, what, why are we afraid of Oculus Rift when we're living in it, right? I mean, we really don't need to be afraid of it. It's already happened. It's just Oculus Rift might be our only way back here. So I'm going to add a little bit to this can of worms. I'm sure we can't go very far into it, but I'm wondering how much of the time collapse is driven by social comparison, where people get their sense of importance from, uh, and just what is considered to be enough or sufficient. Um, that's yeah, right. Those are really good points. Yeah, I often say that the privileged don't suffer from time collapse. They just the, the more privileged I know people are, the, the less they seem to be suffering from the relentless now. Do you know about Bruce Sterling's infamous unrecorded South by Southwest? Okay, so every time Sterling gives a talk, it gets recorded. But in 2000, I'm going to say 12, but that could be wrong. He didn't let him record it. And so all we have are these sort of rumors from people who were there of what happened. And it was about disconnection. And the, the provocative thing he said was poor people love their cell phones. And the idea that... Love their what? Cell phones. Yeah. And the idea that he was arguing what you just said, which is that as you become wealthy, mm -hmm. you disconnect, right? To have... We have told ourselves about the internet that a wealth of connections, right? This is the future. It's a wealth of connections, new ways, blah, 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 blah. But that true, so if that happens, then, it, well, connection is like a sign of needing to hustle, right? Of needing to find friends, to get help, to get a job, to blah, blah. Whereas if you are wealthy, you can go into the garden and have a walk, and you don't need to worry that you won't be able to cover your bills, right? And so you, like, that... And it's, it's a reversal of the story that has traditionally been told about what wealth the internet is bringing into our lives. Oh, it's funny because uh, I, reporters always ask me, like, you know, don't you ever want to take a digital detox vacation? Because there's vacations now where you can go to islands and boats and things. And I said, if you can afford to take a digital detox vacation, you don't have too much information. You have too much money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Seriously, because to Sterling's point, I never knew about this talk, but really I think disconnection is the ultimate privilege. 
Well, the thing is, I think you're absolutely right, but I want to go a little further with that because it's an illusion. People think they don't need those supports, and then they come out on the other side where they have money and they've disconnected, and then they're disconnected. And then you get to the point where you're scrambling to rebuild community out of nothing. That's, you've had hit so many important points today about what's important and where do you find importance in your own life. Oh, well, I think we have to wrap up. Thank you to everybody for being brave and talking about time. Thanks, Aaron Parecki, for, for managing everything. Thank you. Be kind to time. <laughs>